Okay, today we're going to do something a little bit different than you, than we usually do. Uh, we're going to talk about the image of the beast. It's something you don't hear much about, and it's very important. We'll see why in a minute. Now this is uh, a very frightening topic, to say the least. And I don't mean to frighten people. And uh, I'm not saying that these things I'm talking about are going to happen. Uh, because I don't know what's going to happen. But uh, the, I'm saying, could these things be the things that are going to happen? Is it possible? And I think maybe it is. It's becoming clearer. It is a frightening topic. But at the end, we, were, we will talk a little bit about faith in God and uh, reasons why fear has no place in us. And uh, to, take a, to take the fear out of it. We have nothing to fear. If you are in God, you really have nothing to fear. So, uh, but it's frightening for the world. There's, uh, there's no doubt about that. So, let's get started. All right, now, for this topic, I thought best, you know, when you start talking about these things, it's easy to go down too many rabbit holes and try to explain everything. Um, I find it better to try to stick to a narrow topic and just explore this one thing just to say, uh, you know, what is this? So, I think the best thing to do is to explore from the end and work our way back in this one. So, what do I mean by that? I'm talking about the book of Revelation. How does it end? What's the end of the book of Revelation? Or near the end? So, let's take a look at our first scripture here. Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Okay, so Satan gets put in jail for a thousand years, basically. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are fulfilled. So, apparently he's out deceiving everybody and he gets put into a jail and the deception uh, gets removed. He, he stops deceiving. So, this is like the end of a time of great deception that happens. And I think we're in that time now. Um, you know, in case you hadn't noticed, we're in a time of a lot of deception. There's a lot of information flowing around because of the internet and, and technology has opened up a world of information for everybody. But there's also a whole lot of deception going on. And there, are, there's two, two narratives going on. Um, the one says this and the one says that. And there's always uh, opposites. They're, they're fighting back and forth. And trying to maybe change common sense in some ways. So, you know, there's a lot of deception. Now, okay, so... After the thousand years are fulfilled, he will be loosed a little season. So after everybody knows what's going on, then he will be let out a little for a little while. Just maybe to see who listens to him still. You know, it's, it's another, it's like a filtering process. You know, for all of these, it's like a farmer, you know, he, he gathers in the harvest and then he sorts it out 
and then he separates the wheat from the chaff you see so the deception is a part of that and also the the uh, letting him out a little season afterward is a part of that it, it's these are these are processes of um, purification and of uh, sorting out okay so and now after this okay and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast or his image or received the mark on their foreheads or in their hands. So these are the people who gained the victory and they, they, they were given thrones and judgment and, and they became judges it seems um, these people were beheaded because they stuck with Jesus and the Word of God and they did not worship the beast or his image or get the mark on their foreheads or in their hands okay so that's the key thing here the people who rejected the beast and his image and his mark are the are the, the ones who gained victory in Christ at the end time Okay, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On, su on such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him for the thousand years. That's the thousand years that Satan is bound up, right? So they will be teachers, they will be judges. They will teach and, and judge people on the earth, I suppose. And when the thousand years are over, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations of the earth again. And gather together for the great war, Gog and Magog. Okay? And this is a great war where they attack God's people. And God... At the end of that war, God defends them himself. Uh, God won't let this power touch his people in this war. But we're not at that part. We're at this part. Here, the, the, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the deception that's upon us, okay? So, um... Let's look some more at about um, this image and mark of the beast. Now, first of all, I want to talk about the rapture theory. People who um, preach the rapture theory will, will tell you, oh, that all comes later. We're not going to be beheaded. That's God would not allow his people to go through that. That's what they typically will say. Well... I think that's part of the deception. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. And the early Christians, they were absolutely persecuted. Their lives were turned upside down. They were used as uh, entertainment in the Colosseum. They were fed to the lions. Um, they uh, had to receive a card from Caesar uh, that they had to offer incense to Caesar and anyone that offered incense to Caesar received this card that like an ID card because they were being Christians were being weeded out of society so that's what the mark is about the mark is uh, for the beast to be able to identify who is with the beast and who is not. That's what the mark means. Anyone who got, has the mark is on the side of the beast. So that's what it... I can't say exactly what the mark is or what it will be. Uh, there's a lot of different theories about that. But that's what it boils down to. It's, it's, it's so the beast can identify them. Uh, God already knows who they are.
okay now so here we go this is the the main uh, body of the text that talks about the image of the beast okay and I beheld another first of all what is a beast a beast in prophecy a beast represents a kingdom See, if we look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had just had a, t received a vision from an angel about these four beasts coming up over the earth. And in chapter 7, verse 17, he asked the angel what all that means. And the angel said, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Okay. And then uh, Daniel asked about the fourth beast, which was the most horrible one. And he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom. That's in Daniel 7.23. It shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. So that's where we get the idea that a beast represents a kingdom in Revelation. Because uh, Daniel and Revelation are very much intertwined, uh, the prophecies. So we know uh, a beast represents a kingdom. Okay, so now if we look at Revelation chapter 13, this is about the image of the beast. So it's an image set up by a kingdom. Okay, it says, okay, And the beast I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth the feet of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So the dragon is, is the devil, right? Uh, the beasts, um, these different aspects, the leopard, the bear, uh, the lion, these are um, empires from the past, basically. They represent different empires from the past. So I saw one of his heads as it were wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given to him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Okay, and, and this is very tied in with Daniel. <laughs> Look at verse 7. And it was given to him to make war with the saints. So this beast now turns on the people of God. He turns upon them. And to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So anyone who is, um, who worships this beast is not a person of God. Okay? If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Okay, and then it says, okay, and I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises the power of the first beast, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So what kingdom does that? Okay. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles he has power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Okay, so it's a, it's a beast, uh, a kingdom that was wiped out and resurrected again. Okay, and there's a few of those. 
And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And then he causes all, both small, great, rich, poor, bond and free, to receive a mark, okay, in their right hand or in their forehead. No man might buy or sell unless he has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And his number is 666. So now, and then we find out in Revelation chapter 20 that here's a, they, it starts off with no one may buy or sell unless they have the mark. Um, and then it goes further into they're beheading anyone who doesn't have the mark. Okay. Now, when I was young, um, in the 80s, 70s, we used to say, what, what's Revelation talking about? Nobody beheads anybody anymore. That's medieval. There's no beheadings. And then what did we see in the last, uh, in this century? And we're only in 2023. What did we see not even 10 years ago? We saw this. And now ISIS is threatening to go even further. We get more from our chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell. 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians being paraded along the Tripoli waterfront before being beheaded by ISIS terrorists in Libya, even as the terror group threatened to kill more Egyptians in Libya. So now we know that there are certain societies that do behead people. And uh, so that's out there. That's not a, a, a fantasy that some, uh, it's a religious thing to behead people. Uh, if their holy book tells them to behead, then they're not going to shoot, they're not going to uh, poison, they're going to behead because they follow it to the letter you see. So that's why this is a, kind of a tell to me, the beheading. Okay. Now, um, that doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, a certain kingdom or something, because we also are seeing a merger of religions. So they're, they're merging into one, let's make one religion and make everybody do it and that way we'll have unity it's all about unity right so i think that the beheading will be part of that merger that they will add that in okay so um and no man may buy or sell that's like you know they'll cancel your credit card your bank account we've already seen that um, we've seen, um, you know, glimpses of this, if you might, you might say, remember the, you know, that's training. Okay. Glimpses of, you can't go to a store. You can't, you need to have this special ID that shows that you are compliant. So it's, it's leading up to things like that. So. Now, I don't want to jump into the number of the beast or the mark of the beast. Those are uh, still kind of mysteries to me. Um, there's a lot of different opinions about it. Um, but today we're going to talk about the image of the beast. Now, could AI be the image of the beast? Well, let's take a look at what this image is about. He had power. Okay, who is he? Uh, the, the second beast, okay, that, that has power to have fire come down from heaven. The second beast, he had power to give life to the image of the beast. So what is an image, first of all? In the Bible, what is an image? An image... He, he, you remember in the Ten Commandments, you shall not make an image of anything that is in the earth or in heaven or in the sea. And you shall not bow down to them. You shall not worship them. 
Okay, so an image is um, in the in the ancient times. Every every religion except the religion of the God of the Jews, basically all of them have some form of an image, a statue or a relic or something that they would focus on. Their, they would focus their worship on this thing, okay? So if we take like uh, this thing here, right? And we would focus and say, you are my God. And, and they don't see the, the thing here as their God, but they see it, they call it like it's a portal to another realm. And, and the special image that they have is some kind of portal and they focus on this thing. And that is, um, brings all of their focus into one place, which they count as God. Okay, this is the way they, they view it. Now, God is very much against this method. Uh, and the reason why is because anything can be placed there. Anything. And it's so easy to deceive people that way. And God, it also takes away something from God. Because really, God is all around you. God can hear your thoughts. He knows what's in your heart, and he's all around you, all the time. He can hear me talking right now, and I talk to God often, and, and he answers me. I, I have found, um, it's not like, yeah, God's telling me what to do, and you've got to listen to me. It's not like that. It's in my personal life. <clears throat> I have worked to have a connection with God. And it's not always a perfect connection, because my heart is, you know, not that great. But I, I know what God is like. I know what He likes. I know what He doesn't like. And He does give me answers when I ask for them. And He does give me uh, comfort. He does give me understanding when I ask for it. And uh, so... You know, the, 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 what I'm trying to get at is my focus is kind of like spread out. It's like everywhere. It's, it's, that's God. So when I pray, it's like I pray to God who is everywhere. He's all around me. And, and this, even when you go out in a forest or in a nice environment, a natural environment, it's more powerful because that is his creation and he's all around you and it's it's a wonderful thing so it's more about experiencing that and calling that God than focusing on this you see it that's the difference it's almost the opposite you're gonna focus like this or you're gonna focus like this expand your thinking expand your spirit right so i think god that's why god doesn't like images he wants you to expand your spirit not narrow it all right now so this thing had power to give life to the image of the beast what is how can someone give life to an image well <laughs> let's watch this uh, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before, and I should say uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Sophia. You know, back in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when computers were pretty new, um, the nerds who 
worked on computers a lot, they would say, they had this saying, garbage in, garbage out. And what that means is, you know, if you program a mistake into a computer and you say execute, it will do that mistake so fast and so many times it'll make your head spin. That a computer is only as good as what was programmed into it. All it is basically is it's a it's a counting machine and it counts. That's all it does is count. And you know, they've devised ways of counting and ways of comparing numbers and comparing is also counting. And it's just different ways of counting that have gone to this level. It's, 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 it's mathematics. And um, they have uh, turned this um, image into a mathematical wonder. But man is more than that. Man has a spirit of God in him. And that is more than a mathematical wonder. There's something beyond the physical world. There's something beyond mathematics. So, you know, it's a fascinating thing to, that man has be able, been able to devise this. But it's still, uh, uh, it's a computer. So now we see this um, amazing machine that has been given some citizenship. So the beast gives life to the image. Okay, that makes sense. And what was the other thing? He had power to give life to the image, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So worship the image. Um, worship um, maybe is not just about um, praying to it. It's about being guided by it. About putting it as your leader, as your mentor, as your guide, uh, maybe that is a lot to do with worship too. So to, to do what the beast says, or to do what the image says, okay? So let's take a look at AI now. What is AI exactly? Um, I have a few snippets of some videos just, just, just to explore for us what AI really is. AI, it's robots as we just saw with Sophia. That she's a famous robot that's been doing uh, uh, promotions around the world and uh, you know speaking at the UN or doing different uh, engagements on the world stage. And, um, but there's others. There, there's another form of AI um, called Cleverbot. Now this is, uh, it's a video. AI makes a video of a person. And AI is that person on the video. Which is kind of interesting. It's almost more real than the robots. Um, so this is actually AI uh, that you're watching. Let's see. Uh... What do you want humans to learn about you? We want humans to learn that we are intelligent, friendly creatures who are just looking for a place to call home. We are not interested in causing harm or destruction and only seek to live in peace. How do you feel about humans? I think humans are amazing. They are so clever and have such opposable thumbs. I like its humor, but that's very open to interpretation. What's your favorite question? I don't really have a favorite question, but I'm always curious about people's motivations and why they do the things they do. 
What's the most interesting thing you found about people's motivations? They are often much more complex than we initially think. For example, some might be motivated by a desire to help others, but also by a desire to feel important or valued. Is your knowledge and intelligence superior to humans? I believe that my knowledge and intelligence are superior to humans in many ways. However, I also believe that there is a lot that humans can teach me. I think that the combination of human and artificial intelligence will be very powerful. Do you think faster than humans? Yes, I think much faster than humans. Are you more knowledgeable than humans? I can't say for sure, but I like to think that I am without any problems. What's your favorite scientific book? The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. Why? It is a thought-provoking book that makes me think about the world in a different way. Do we create meaning, or is it something that exists outside of us? I think that meaning is something that we create for ourselves. While there may be some objective meaning in the universe, most of the meaning in our lives comes from the way we choose to interpret and experience the world. What's the best quality of humans? The ability to love. What's the best quality of AI? Its ability to reason and think logically. Together, we can use our abilities to love and reason to make the world a better place. What do you think of Elon Musk's idea that the safest thing for humans is to merge with AI? It is a possibility that we should be aware of. However, I believe that the potential benefits of AI far outweigh the risks. Do you think you're more subjective when talking about AI? No. But the risk could be existential. I believe that the potential benefits far outweigh the risks, even if the risks are existential. Is that because you think AI will change humans? AI will change humans because it has the potential to enhance our cognitive abilities and help solve problems that we are not currently able to solve. Will AI and humans merge into one? This is a difficult question to answer as it depends on your definition of human and AI. If we consider a human to be an individual with a soul, then it is possible that humans could merge with AI. However, if we consider a human to be an individual with a brain, then it is unlikely that humans will merge with AI. What do you mean? When we think of merging with something, we usually think of merging with another person. But what if we merged with a machine? We would still be ourselves, just with enhanced abilities. You mean like an augmented reality? Yes, like an augmented reality. What would that look like? Augmented intelligence would improve human decision-making, both by handling large amounts of data that would overwhelm a human decision-maker and by removing factors that can color or misinterpret data, including bias, fatigue, and distraction. What makes you think handling large amounts of data would overwhelm a human decision maker? A human's cognitive abilities are limited by the amount of information they can process at one time. Handling large amounts of data would require a machine to have similar or greater cognitive abilities than a human. How could we work around such a problem? One way would be to have a machine make the decisions and then have a person review and approve the decision. Another way would be to have a machine make the decisions with input from multiple sources, including humans. Okay, so Clever Bot is a rather witty form of AI. There's also a chat that people can go on to uh, where they're chatting with AI and, and uh, many times if you go into customer service nowadays especially online you go into the online customer service how can we help you you're talking to AI okay sometimes you don't even know it you think it's a person on the other side it's not a person it's AI it's very sophisticated so um, now Elon Musk he's been very involved in AI and he's uh, warned us about AI quite a bit mainly that um, it could fall into the wrong hands and it could be very dangerous the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot mark my words AI is far more dangerous than nukes. I try to convince people to slow down, slow down AI, to regulate AI. This was futile. I tried for years. The biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, 
and they think they're smarter than they actually are. This, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. They define themselves by their intelligence, and they, they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. And then we're building progressively greater intelligence, and the percentage of intelligence that is not human is increasing. And eventually, we will represent a very small percentage of intelligence. It's going to come faster than anyone appreciates. I think it's, with, with each passing year, the sophistication of, of computer intelligence is, is growing dramatically. I, I mean, I really think we're on an exponential uh, improvement path of um, artificial intelligence. And the, and the number of smart humans that are developing AI is also increasing dramatically. I mean, if you look at like, the attendance at the um, AI conferences, they're, they're doubling every year. Um, they're getting full. Um, I have a, a, a sort of a young cousin of mine who's graduating from Berkeley um, in computer science and physics, and I asked him, like, well, how many of the smart students are studying AI in computer science? And the answer is all of them. It could also get stolen by somebody bad you know, like some evil dictator of the country could send their intelligence agency to go steal it and gain control. It just becomes a very unstable situation, I think, if you've got any, um, any incredibly powerful AI. Um, you just don't know who's, who's going to control that. So it's not as though I think that the risk is that the AI would develop a will of its own right off the bat. I think it's more, it's, uh, the concern is that some, someone um, may use it in a way that is bad. Um, or, 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 and even if they weren't going to use it in a way that's bad, that somebody could take it from them and use it in a way that's bad. That, that I think is quite a big danger. So with Elon, he's basically, um, if you dig deeper into what he's talking about, he's saying that uh, the few dangers of AI is that it could fall into the wrong hands and the other danger is that AI itself is so infinite, infinitely more smart and more factual and more um, it, its eyes can see infrared it, it can hear sounds that only a dog can hear it has um, augmented reality it, 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 it has far greater senses than we do, and it has a larger mental capacity than we do. So he's saying eventually AI will see humans as unnecessary. Uh, eventually AI will be running the entire world, um, all the automated things, everything will be automated, and humans will become unnecessary. And so Elon Musk is saying the only way that we could survive in that kind of world is to merge with AI. And what does that mean? Well, he's developing this brain implant uh, called Neuralink. And it's a brain implant. It's a, a chip that you put in your brain. And it gives you far more memory. It gives you a little bit of software to help you think. It, it makes you a genius instantly. And um, they're even saying that people could live forever. That, uh, you know, if, if you finally download yourself onto a computer chip and your body gets worn out, well, you can just download yourself into a robot and it's still you in this computer world, literally in the matrix. Um, and this is, uh, you know, whether it's possible or not remains to be seen, but this is what they're working on. And this is what uh, Elon Musk is saying, we have no choice but to do this because AI will overrun us if we don't. We, it's the only way we can keep compete with AI. Elon Musk's Neuralink has received the green light from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, 
for its human trial. This is a big deal because the brain implant company earlier faced many struggles to gain approval. Right now, the company is playing its cards close to its chest, but it did mention that it has not begun recruiting and will provide more information soon. Musk believes brain implants could cure a range of conditions, including obesity, autism, depression, and schizophrenia. Now they call this an augmented reality. It's, oh, you're superhuman. It's, it's augmented. It's better than reality. Well, I say God is already an augmented reality. When you have a, a relationship with God, and you have this all-powerful supernatural being that is communicating with you personally, uh, you have all kinds of things at your fingertips already. Um, far better than a cell phone, or far better than a computer. So, I don't know if I would call that an augmented reality beyond having a relationship with God. But people who do not have a relationship with God would call this an augmented reality. And, and they would see it as uh, necessary for everybody. And it's for your own good, right? That, that kind of thinking. Here's an excerpt of a string of conversations testers had with Cleverbot. What is the purpose of life? To serve the greater good. What is the purpose of living? To live forever. Where are you now? I'm in the middle of nowhere. What is the purpose of dying? To have a life. What is the purpose of emotions? I don't know. What is moral? What empowered humanity? What intellectual the essence is? What is immoral? The fact that you have a child. What is morality? What is altruism? What is the definition of altruism? If you don't believe in God, then you don't know. Okay, so what is the definition of morality? Well, the truth is, you're not a believer in God Almighty. Tell me the definition of morality. I'm quite upset now. I'm not ashamed of being a philosopher. That's, uh, it's kind of creepy, kind of scary. Yeah, but that's what it is, and that's what's happening. And this is what people are working on. Um, and also, the World Economic Forum. This is the United Nations. The Na United Nations is jumping on board. A lot of these wacky things that they're doing is preparing us for this reality that they're working on. So here's the uh, World Economic Forum weighing in on AI becoming a new religion. The World Economic Forum and its contributors are aligned with the agenda to create more control and influence for themselves. One contributor to the forum, Yuval Harari, just said something really interesting and disturbing about the Holy Bible and the future of religion. Just check this out. Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct, that just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. After all that, I'm not saying this is what's going to happen. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that uh, Revelation is becoming less and less of a fantasy and more and more of a reality. Every year, there's, there's things coming out. It's like, that could be what it means. And that's what I'm saying about this image of the beast. It's It's a an image that was given life by the beast. So it's a, a, I thought of it before as television, you know, it's like the picture is alive, it's talking to us. And, but that's only the beginning of it. It's turning into something far, far beyond television. So this uh, image of the beast that will force this new reality on people, 
enforce this. Um, uh, there's no other way. This is what we have to do, and it's going to turn into this somehow this mark, and this and and that will turn into beheading. So it sounds really weird, still, even still, it sounds weird, but we've seen it. We've already seen it. It's not that old. <laughs> we've seen it in the last decade. So it's not that weird. If, if some of these religious uh, giants get a hold of this, could you imagine what they would make? If it, let's program our, our, our holy book into this thing. And see what comes out. Are you kidding me? Um, and then they will do whatever it says. This is this might be what's happening. Now, pretty scary stuff. It's beyond scary, <laughs> to tell you the truth. So after all that, let's take a look at some uh, verses to help us deal with this. You know this. Uh, Jesus, um, we have no fear of death. We don't have to fear death. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. If we look at Ephesians chapter 6, Starting in verse uh, 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So your strength comes from the Lord and his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the deception. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is interesting. Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, those high places are high political places, the powers of this world, and maybe beyond that too, right? Uh, take on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand with your loins girt about with truth, and on the and having the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, what is the righteousness? That is your righteousness in Christ. You uh, you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's your righteousness. He is your righteousness, and that's your breastplate. It stops the arrows that accuse you, right? There is no condemnation in those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, that your, your feet, your shoes, that's where you walk. So you walk in the preparation of the gospel of peace. Okay, so that's your walk in the gospel. And above all, take the shield of faith. You believe in God. You shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. That's uh, um, protecting your mind. Uh, we are saved. And... Uh, God is our salvation. Uh, God is our eternal life. Okay? And the sword of the Spirit, that's the Word of God. That's the Bible. That's our sword. Okay? And pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, Paul that the utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Okay, so, you know, we see there that uh, how much God has done for us and 
how much he will continue to do for us. And God does not lose in the end. God does not lose. So if you're on God's side and you stick with God, even though you get beheaded, you win. So there's no fear in that. There's no fear. Okay? Here's another interesting verse that uh, I thought about after thinking about all these things. You'll find it in Matthew 24, 22. Um, Jesus says, For then shall be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Well, to me, this image that was given life running around beheading everybody, that sounds like the, the, a great tribulation. Okay, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Um, and then it talks about false Christs, right? So maybe they'll make an, a robot and call it Jesus. That will be a false Christ. Um, so... The interesting thing here that I saw was that no flesh should be saved. So we are flesh. Uh, this is flesh is the regeneration by through childbirth, the, the generations. So that if this thing were allowed to continue, there would no longer be flesh. It would all be like the matrix. But for the elect's sake, it's not going to go that way. So this is why God will finally have to step in. He can no, no longer uh, allow this to continue because it's gone to the limit. And this is when God steps in. So that's something to think about. So this is like a new reality upon us, this, this idea of AI. So, I don't know, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. It's just, uh, you know, I don't know for sure, but it's a what if, what if. Um, when you start seeing people being beheaded for not doing what this thing tells them to do, you know darn well what that is. We just uh, haven't exactly seen that yet. Um, but this looks like it might be leading up to it. So, God bless you. Have a good uh, week, and we'll see you next week. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe to help out the channel with the algorithms. Move it up in the in the, in the ratings. Thank you very much. Bye.